Dr. Karan, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I want to ask first about the White House's response to this latest increase in cases. And as I mentioned earlier, the White House has tried to ramp up sending free tests to Americans. But outlets like Politico are now reporting that health officials are also considering sending KN95 and N95 masks to Americans as well, as the CDC also considers guidance about upgrading to these masks to protect against Omicron. How do you think ramping up these masking policies might help given the latest spread? Thanks so much for having me. Um, I think that this is critical. Uh, as we've said for sort of the entire pandemic, you cannot uh, rely on sort of only a single intervention such as vaccines. Part of the reason is that you have variants. These are not, um, these vaccines don't provide steril sterilizing immunity, meaning that they don't stop all infections. They are working to do what they're meant to do, which is to stop severe disease and hospitalizations. But to stop the spread, you need many other um, uh, methods as well. So one of those is the rapid antigen test, which, uh, you know, if you use those, it can stop you from becoming a super spreader unknowingly. Uh, but secondly, as you pointed out, is the high filtration masks. And uh, we have been pushing this really since March 2020. Part of the reason is because we know that the virus transmits primarily through aerosols, small airborne particles that float around. Um, they can go beyond six feet, although the closer you are to someone, the more likely you transmit. And these masks, the higher filtration masks are designed specifically to pull these aerosol particles in via electrostatic charge of the material. And they, have a, they function in two ways. One of them is to prevent someone who's infectious from spreading it to those around them. And as you know, people are infectious without knowing it. A lot of people think it may be allergies or it may be a scratchy throat from something else. Other people develop symptoms uh, slowly, but they can still be contagious. Uh, and so, and the second thing is to protect you, the wearer from those around you, because you can't control what people around you are doing. Some places have mask mandates, some don't. And so this is critical. Dr. Anjali here. I want to specifically follow up on the mask because we know that that's a big issue right now, something you've really advocated for. I want to get you to listen to what was said at the COVID-19 response team earlier uh, about masking. Listen for a minute. Right now, we are uh, strongly considering options to make more high quality masks available to all Americans. And we'll continue to follow the science here. Uh, the CDC is in the lead. But this is an act. This is an area that uh, we're actively uh, exploring. Dr. Walensky. Yeah, maybe I'll just add that CDC continues to recommend that any mask is better than no mask, and we do encourage um, all Americans to wear a well-fitting mask to protect themselves and prevent the spread of COVID-19. So as you can hear, really pushing the idea of the need for better masking, but then also saying simultaneously that any mask is better than no mask. How does this play out, especially as we know that, you know, some Americans may not be able to afford these better masks? Yeah, so we've heard this sort of pushback from uh, day one. Any mask is better than no mask. Yes, we're well aware of that, but we need to get the bar higher. It's been two years now of hearing the same message. Uh, we have an even more contagious uh, variant, a more transmissible variant now that we're dealing with. It still transmits via the airborne route. Um, and we know that certain places are just taking it into their own hands. Salt Lake City, for instance, is actually now requiring with their indoor mask mandate for four weeks that you wear a respirator. And they are providing these for free at the library, at other places around town, both N95 and KN95 masks. You know, the other thing we've heard so many times is, oh, N95s may be too uncomfortable. Well, N95s come in many different um, uh, model types for the mask. I, I have a few right here with me. Um, you know, the Gerson duckbill is a NIOSH approved N95. The Indiana mask is a NIOSH approved N95. These are very comfortable, way more comfortable than what we use sometimes in the hospital, these older hard shell models. And so I think that we have supply. We need a strategy. What we need is to have these ubiquitously available. If you're going to do a mask mandate, do it with masks that actually work and, and get you what you need, which is a slow spread immediately. And every day lost is a day that we have more exponential spread. We're going to run into more problems. Hospitals are getting strained now. You know, there's really no good reason not to do this. I know one of the most popular ideas to help support that and has been since pretty much the start of the pandemic is trying to get using the United Postal Service uh, to get those masks out. And I know that, uh, for example, Senator Bernie Sanders has been one of the biggest proponents of this, pushing for uh, the, Id the idea to go through bringing a bill to the floor that which did not make it through the first time around. And he is committed to continuing that effort. We also know that uh, U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy is behind this push for better masking. Uh, with all of this, you know, with all these leaders still pushing for 
effort. We, we haven't seemed to, got any, to get anywhere, even though we have, for example, the testing, the at-home rapid testing come to fruition. What's missing here? How do we get to that point? What, 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 when can the, what can the federal government really do? You know, I think part of it seems to be that, as we've seen with many other waves, maybe there's some sentiment of hoping this passes and goes away and doesn't come back. That hasn't worked out too well over the last two years. We know that variants with so many people unvaccinated, with patients who are immunocompromised, who have a tough time clearing the virus, we are at risk for ongoing variants and they're gonna to continue to transmit via the airborne route. And so having these masks on hand makes a lot of sense. I think we have to keep pushing, keep pushing the message forward. We just wrote an op-ed in Washington Post arguing that you, there are very comfortable N95 options that actually breathability of masks is a technical measurement based on the pressure drop. This is not just a subjective measurement that some people say that certain models are uncomfortable. I mean, we need a public health strategy and part of public health is getting these interventions to people, bringing it into communities, making them ubiquitously available so that people don't have to go search for their own masks or run to Home Depot and, you know, people that have time and can afford it get the masks and those that don't, don't get the masks. That's not public health. Public health is, uh, it needs to be organized. It has to have equity at the center and we need to get more resources to people. This is how we keep people safe when they go into the workplace. I I'm not sure what's unclear to this uh, when, when, for our leaders. Well, when you talk about our leaders, what they're doing now seems like too little too late because by the time those products get produced and then sent to all of us, won't we be past all of this? Or you said something that made my ears perk up when you talked about different variants. Is there an end date? I, there's just such fatigue, whether the mask is uncomfortable or not. I mean, people seem to be just saying to heck with it all. Yeah, so I think the key here is that we need to focus on uh, the difference between having low levels of virus that's circulating versus having large epidemic surges that strain hospitals, strain healthcare systems. You have tons of healthcare workers getting infected at the same time and not being able to work. That's a very different state than getting the virus to low levels where you have a lot of people vaccinated, the chance that when you go out to the grocery store or go to a restaurant, the chance of you getting infected will be much lower when you're not in a surge like this. And so I think that it's very important for people to realize that even if we don't completely eradicate or get rid of COVID altogether, there's still something to be said for making sure that we don't let infections get to epidemic levels. And if we deal with a virus, a variant in the future that is uh, more severe, that is also more transmissible, we can't predict the future. Anyone that's tried to has not done a good job of predicting it. We should have that backup, that preventative option available. Just like uh, one of my colleagues says, like a fire hydrant in your house, you should have an access to a respirator that works in case we need it. This is about prevention, being prepared. You're right that you know, in some places we're starting to see the peaks start to come down now, um, but that is not an argument against prevention. In fact, that's an argument to say, if we get this under control right now, we have another period of time where we can get prepared. Are we gonna do it or not? On that point of, are we gonna do it or not? One of the things that I know has been quite largely discussed is the idea of offices, of course, getting back to work and getting back in offices and what that entails, because we can't keep wearing masks forever and air filtration systems. Where are we now on sort of the understanding of, you know, COVID being airborne and what the needs are to help really deal with it? Yeah, absolutely. I think the hospital is actually a great place to look at this because you have many measures in place in hospitals, particularly around ventilation. And so when we have patients who are in airborne ventilation rooms, we have more air changes per hour that can clear out 99% of particles in less time, the more air changes you have. And so we need to start thinking about healthier workplaces, getting better ventilation into our workplaces. Uh, you know, it's fundamentally a trend, uh, a shift in how we think about the air altogether. For a, bit, for a long time, we've thought about many other mediums like dirty water needing to be cleaned, washing your hands. It's time we start thinking about the air in the same way. The air can transmit viruses effectively. We need to get clean, cleaner air. And when we get safer buildings and we get other um, measures in place, then you have less of a need for PPE in the future. Um, unfortunately, right now, we're not quite at that point. And especially during a surge, it's hard to completely um, you know, restructure ventilation system. That can't be done necessarily overnight. Whereas getting a high filtration mask on for now can be, you know, a lot of these are backstop measures to sort of slow spread as fast as possible. In the bigger picture, we need to really push vaccinating uh, more people all around the world so that they're, the virus has less susceptible targets to go and replicate in and transmit through. Um, so there's many parts to this, but I, I totally agree with you. Getting safer buildings is a key part of it. Dr. Abrar Karan is Stanford University Fellow in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Geographic Medicine, and Anjali Kamlani is our own senior healthcare reporter. We thank you so much for speaking with us.